Well, thank you very much. National Cabinet have had a very successful meeting here in Brisbane today, and I want to begin by thanking Anastasia for hosting us uh, here in the great state of Queensland. Uh, today, we've determined a range of reforms around the theme of a better future for the Federation. We all know that the challenge uh, that we have with global inflation, with pressures on our economy, mean that the Commonwealth needs to work with state and territory governments in a cooperative way in order to achieve reform, to achieve our common objectives of lifting up the living standards of Australians, creating greater economic opportunities, creating employment and making sure that no one is left behind. And I want to thank the Premiers and Chief Ministers for the once again cooperative approach that they have taken, not just at this morning's meeting, uh, but in the lead up to today's meeting as well. Front and centre, as we indicated at the last time we had a National Cabinet meeting, is of course health. And in health, First Ministers reaffirmed our commitment to health as the priority for National Cabinet in 2023. And indeed, we agreed that we will have a special meeting of National Cabinet in the fourth quarter uh, to discuss uh, further health reform. Uh, today, though, we received, of course, a range of uh, reports and work has been done, uh, including the work of the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. And today, to preempt some of the announcements that will be in the federal budget in uh, a week and a half's time, uh, I am pleased to say that we agreed and there was endorsement for the Commonwealth's uh, initial uh, announcements when it comes to health of some $2.2 billion of practical measures to strengthen Medicare. One of the things that we need to do is to improve primary care delivery so that it takes pressure off our public hospital systems around the country. And these reforms are practical and will make a difference. Firstly, supporting workforces to work at top of scope, including pharmacists, nurses and paramedics. We need to provide pharmacists with the opportunity uh, to deliver the services that they're capable of. That will provide uh, support and income for community pharmacies, but it will also take pressure off our GPs and off that system as well in the primary healthcare network. We want to expand the nursing workforce to improve access to primary care. The third is improving access to and delivery of after hours deliver of primary care. That will include a, an incentive uh, for doctors, for GPs to stay open in longer hours that will be included in our budget uh, when it's handed down on May 9. We'll introduce My Medicare Patient ID to support wraparound care for patients registered with their local GP through new blended payment models. One of the things that's been identified is patients who will regularly uh, turn up at uh, emergency departments. We want to uh, make sure there's a registration there so that we can reach out. What are the issues that are actually driving those regular presentations? Uh, it might be a mental health issue, it might be alcohol and drug problems. How do we reach out in order to assist people but at the same time take pressure off those emergency departments? We will, we will provide flexible funding for multidisciplinary team-based models to improve quality of care. And lastly, in the budget, there'll be measures to invest in digital health to improve health outcomes. Uh, First Ministers also endorsed the independent review of overseas health practitioner regulatory set settings in a report that was led by Robin Cruck. We need to make sure that some of the bureaucracy that is taking too long to make sure that people with qualifications can actually participate and provide uh, health care in this country and that is part of a uh, part of that process. Uh, we will continue to work and will task health ministers with working to progress the recommendations and report back uh, to the National Cabinet and we will have a meeting as I said in the last quarter of 2023 
dedicated to that. Uh, the First Ministers and National Cabinet also discussed our NDIS financial sustainability framework. We need to have a sustainable growth trajectory for the NDIS in order to support equity and fairness for all Australians who are living with disability, including those not eligible for the NDIS and ensure that every dollar goes to those who need it most. We know that the trajectory of NDIS expenditure is just not sustainable into the future. Indeed, that trajectory projects some $97 billion on the NDIS over in the medium term. So in 10 years time, uh, when you look at uh, the budget framework, and that is simply uh, not sustainable. The growth uh, over the period in between the last budget and October, of course, was alone uh, some $8 billion uh, in just those few months. So we want to make sure that the promise of the NDIS is fulfilled. We want to make sure that the Commonwealth can work with the NDIA board to take immediate action to ensure a sustainable scheme. And in order to do that, we're committing $720 million in the upcoming budget to lift the NDIA's capability, capacity and systems so that it provides better support for participants. The framework is the next step and will provide an annual growth target in the total costs of the scheme of no more than 8% by 1 July 2026, with further moderation of growth as the scheme matures. Everyone here is absolutely committed to the NDIS. We want to make sure that it actually can continue into the future in a sustainable way. Uh, we had a range of measures around the theme of better planning for stronger growth. Housing ministers will develop a proposal for National Cabinet to deal with uh, later this year, outlining reforms to strengthen renters' rights across the country. State and Territory Governments have a range of measures in place. We want to make sure we look at best practice and that we strengthen the rights of renters. As part of the new National Migration Strategy, the Commonwealth will ensure that states and territories have a greater contribution to Australia's migration settings as well. We need to make sure that we get the right people in the right places in order to fulfil the jobs and the demand that is there for skilled labour and for workforce uh, without putting undue pressure on particular areas of Australia where there's been a concentration in the past. And that will be uh, important going forward. The Commonwealth is commencing an independent review of the Infrastructure Investment Program, adopting a refreshed approach to infrastructure investment. Uh, we want to be able to examine uh, the former government's program uh, that, quite frankly, had uh, inadequate amounts uh, allocated for some projects. They simply aren't enough for those projects to proceed. And quite frankly, the National Party has its imprint all over the infrastructure program. Uh, we know the debacle that is inland rail, for example, a program that has been going for years where the costs have blown out to in excess of $30 billion, blown out by more than four times, and yet still doesn't have a path or a plan to get to a port, either in Brisbane or Gladstone or in Melbourne. That's an example of the failed program that was presided over uh, by our predecessors. I want to emphasise that existing commitments that have been made by my government, whether before the election or since, of course, uh, will not be impacted by that and will continue to get on with the job of delivering uh, those projects. Uh, we want to work with states and territories uh, to support a more sustainable infrastructure pipeline to provide certainty going forward and to make sure that we deliver. Within the next six months, planning ministers will also develop a proposal for National Cabinet uh, to outline reforms to increase housing supply and affordability, working with the Australian Local Government Association as well. 
In addition to that, the Commonwealth is also making substantial new investments, supporting a better migration system through increased visa processing capacity by expanding pathways to permanent residence for temporary skilled sponsored workers and taking steps to address migrant exploitation. Uh, we know that in this country we have had a demand for everything from engineers to nurses to uh, skilled workers, carpenters, uh, bricklayers, uh, people who, uh, who have skills that are needed in the economy. The idea that we don't provide a permanent pathway for those skilled workers that we need is quite frankly uh, not serving our country's interest and Claire O'Neill outlined uh, the strategy uh, yesterday and we want to work with state and territories on those issues. We want also to have continued investment to enable a pipeline of new social and affordable housing, including the delivery of our Housing Australia Future Fund, a $10 billion fund that is being held up by the Coalition and the Greens political party in the Senate at this point in time. You can't argue you want more housing supply and more social and affordable housing if you are continuing to oppose that program and we'll be continuing to support that. In addition to that, in the budget we'll expand the capacity of the affordable housing bond aggregator by expanding the liability cap by $2 billion. That's the fund that provides uh, money for investment by community housing to expand uh, support for the community housing sector to increase supply for affordable housing that is so needed. We'll also offer incentives to increase the supply of housing in our budget. We'll increase the depreciation rate from 2.5% to 4% per year for eligible new build to rent projects where construction commences after the budget date of 9th of May 2023. And we'll also reduce the withholding tax rate for eligible fund payments from managed investment trusts to foreign residents on income from newly constructed residential build to rent properties after the 1st of July 2024 from 30% to 15% subject to further consultation on eligibility criteria. Uh, First Ministers also considered the work that is occurring uh, between Skills Ministers. We know that arising out of the Jobs and Skills Summit uh, we produced an agreement delivering some 180,000 fee-free take places that is now, are now being delivered right around the country. And we want to work together for a new long-term national skills agreement. Uh, we're working as well on net zero transformation. And uh, we, of course, agreed with the principals there uh, last year in 2022. And we want to make sure uh, that as communities are in uh, transition, uh, that there's support provided for that transformation. Uh, the care and support economy, we discuss the importance of, uh, of those issues uh, going forward and having a strategy including an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander care and support workforce. And lastly, uh, the National Cabinet, given, given the change in composition uh, at the National Cabinet, I want to welcome uh, the New South Wales Premier, Chris Minns, to his first National Cabinet meeting. Uh, we reaffirmed our unanimous support as leaders uh, to the statement of intent that was signed in February of support for the referendum for constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in a referendum to be held in the last quarter of this year and listening to them, listening to them in order to close the gap and make a practical difference to the lives of the most disadvantaged group in Australia. Uh, we're happy to take questions. Prime Minister, a number of uh, Premiers behind this morning raised GP shortages as one of the key issues on the health front. What is being done uh, to, to fix that and do you can see the boost to GP numbers is years away given the length of time it takes to train a GP? Well we're working uh, to provide support and the measures uh, that I spoke about of uh, the $2.2 billion program are all aimed at providing greater GP access, aimed at 
primary health care and how you support that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the Cruck report done by Robin Cruck is about how you get people to be able to be registered as GPs who are eligible in a more efficient way as well. So there's not a single solution. There are a range of reforms, uh, six of which substantial new reforms, new commitments from the Commonwealth with real dollars over the forward estimates in order to make a difference. But in addition to that, uh, we agreed to continue to work on this. Uh, this has been uh, a, a decade of neglect prior to the election of my government, uh, where Medicare and primary health care was not a major priority. Uh, we want to make it a priority. We're working on practical examples. And in areas like, uh, to use as an example, uh, the, uh, the frequent uh, user program, if you like, people who are fronting up to emergency departments on a regular basis, making sure that they're able to be given that outreach of support is something uh, that originated from Victoria. Uh, people on the ground who run the hospital system uh, know the pressure that it's under. And the Commonwealth is up for ideas on how we improve uh, primary health care. Uh, the funding, additional funding that we'll have in our budget for after hours uh, GPs to continue to operate is important as well. The urgent care clinics that we are establishing and uh, we've made announcements in South Australia, in Western Australia, in Victoria, uh, around a range of the states in Tasmania and uh, I'll be in another state or territory to narrow it down in the, uh, in the coming days uh, to announce further urgent care clinics. The aim of them is urgent care clinics that will be open uh, longer hours, 8am to 10pm, providing services uh, to that for many people who, who can't get access to a GP, getting access for those uh, health needs that aren't acute, uh, that don't require them to be in an emergency department of a hospital, uh, but uh, can be fixed and fixed with the only thing you need is your Medicare card, with bulk billing available. Now that is a, a major initiative uh, that already there will be a range of these urgent care clinics up and running uh, on July 1, uh, as we committed to do, and that will make an enormous difference. So we're working uh, together collaboratively to make a difference. Prime Minister, you mentioned strengthening um, ranges rights across the country. Obviously the settings are different across the jurisdictions. Is the report by housing ministers about uniform national Well, there are a range of measures uh, that each of the state and territory jurisdictions have, have different provisions. And so uh, what uh, we're not seeking to do is to have absolutely uniform uh, because different states will have different circumstances. Uh, but there are measures and commitments. Every state and territory is doing something in this area. So what uh, will occur over coming months is looking at the different programs that are in place, some of those are around the frequency of any rent increase that can occur. Uh, in at least one jurisdiction's case, it's also over the amount uh, that can occur of any increase. Uh, there are a range of measures that will be considered uh, by state and territory governments uh, to strengthen uh, the system of renters' rights. There was agreement uh, on that. Uh, there will, it's up to states and territories, this is within uh, their uh, power uh, to, to determine. So it, uh, I, I doubt whether you'll have a completely uniform system coming out, uh, but what you will have is that exchange and housing ministers working together over coming months. When will the process back to your point about the sustainability, the need for the NDIS to be sustainable? Yeah. Uh, is there a point at which the federal government will be approaching the states and territories to restore the 50-50 arrangement, the dollar-for-dollar dollar funding arrangement, or will the Commonwealth continue to contribute that extra 16%? Well, one of the things about the... Well, that, that figure varies. That's the point as it goes forward. If the projections the way that they are at the moment continued, then the Commonwealth at the end of the medium term would be contributing 82% 
of $97 billion in the NDIS. Now, the growth factor uh, when the NDIS was introduced uh, was anticipated to be 4%, uh, which is why the, the cap on spending from state and territory governments is 4%. Uh, now, we're not proposing to change that. Uh, we want to work in a cooperative way, uh, but states and territories can assist, obviously, in that process. But we're not, we're not trying to change that. We are trying, though, uh, to recognise uh, with an 8% an target by the end of the forward estimates and then uh, putting it on a, a, a further uh, sustainable uh, trajectory to make sure that this scheme can continue to deliver that we don't find ourselves in a situation down the track where the viability of what is a critical scheme for Australia is drawn into question. Uh, because the NDIS is an important national reform. Uh, people who need that support uh, should get it. And so there are obvious, though, issues with the way that the scheme is being administered. That's why we're providing uh, substantial funding uh, for the uh, some uh, seven, I, I said the figure before about how much we are providing for uh, the NDIS uh, going forward, $720 million in the, the budget, will be in the budget on May 9, because we want to make sure that it's sustainable, that the people who need support are getting it that the issues that have been identified, there's issues of fraud have been identified in some cases, but other issues as well, re-costs, so that the costs of some uh, technology or support, uh, physical support uh, for devices, uh, for people, uh, that there hasn't been a false inflationary cost to them because they're registered in the NDIS uh, as eligible equipment to be used, for example. Uh, we want to work with uh, Kurt Fernley, who's doing a terrific job, and I'm very pleased that he's uh, come on board as the chair to make sure that it is sustainable. Uh, but it's about making sure as well that, that that is what we're doing. Why are we doing it? We're doing it so that NDIS participants can continue to get the support that they need. Well, well, the all these incentives for GPs stop doctors from burning out and will it simply see GPs being spread far too thin? Uh, no. And we need, clearly, we're, we've also had plans about workforce planning, about how we get increased number of GPs in, and we've already had some trial programs and some programs on the ground. For example, uh, the program that I announced with uh, Premier Rockcliffe in Devonport is about how we can get uh, GPs in Tasmania into rural and regional services by essentially having them employed through the public hospital system. Uh, we're up for there, There's not a single solution whereby you stand here and say, this is the one measure we have uh, that will solve the issue. What we're determined to do as a national cabinet is to work co collaboratively, is to make sure that uh, we, we take in the full suite of ideas uh, which have uh, come in uh, from each of the states and territories to make sure that we deliver this difference. Prime Minister, um, I'm, I'm told a few months ago Mr Andrews here was asking for the 50-50 funding for hospitals to be reinstated. Um, is that completely off the table? Is there an opportunity to uh, bring that back? Well, the, the, the point is that, that if you have the existing system with a change in the relative payments, that doesn't change the system. That doesn't change that. And what we're determined to do, um, whilst I'm sure that every state, I'll, I'll make this prediction, every state premier and chief minister, if I said to them we're going to provide 50-50, they'd say, that's great, but 60-40 would be better from the Commonwealth, and 70-30 would be better still. Like, that's the nature of it. But what we're discussing here, and, and uh, that's perfectly understandable, what we're discussing here and what the Premiers have done 
is come up with practical outcomes of reform that makes a difference, that recognises that there is a, a finite uh, funds from all levels of government are under pressure. How do we make sure that every dollar of value uh, comes from taxpayers' expenditure? And if we just put additional money into public hospitals without doing anything about primary health care, then guess what? That would not be making a difference. And, and what we're determined to do is to reform in a practical way. Yeah. Are you really going to be DJing a radio shop jocks wedding with questionable underfigures in this room? <laughs> well, I, I'm not in charge of the invite list. Uh, I was invited uh, by Carl Sanderlin's uh, to uh, his wedding, uh, which is taking place uh, tomorrow in Sydney. I accepted that invitation uh, and uh, I intend to uh, attend uh, the wedding. Uh, Carl Sanderlands is uh, someone who's a significant figure. And one of the things about Carl Sanderlands, I'll say this, um, a, a bloke who at one stage was homeless, living on the streets of Sydney and has grown into someone who is a significant uh, public figure uh, is a, a part of uh, what is an Australian success story. Uh, so I uh, was invited uh, to the wedding. I said I would go and I keep my commitments including to Kyle Sanderlands. We're about making sure that uh, we all have an interest in uh, developing, uh, making sure that the NDIS is sustainable going forward, and, and, and that's agreed. And that isn't just about jurisdictions, that's about the values of the people who stand up here. That's what it's about, making sure that people with disabilities get the support that they need, uh, so that as well they can contribute fully to the economy. One of the things about the NDIS and making sure that people with disabilities can fully participate in society is that that produces not shouldn't be seen as a cost. That's an investment. It's an investment in our economy, but it's also an investment in in our humanity, and it, it's those values that I share with everyone here. I'm giving you everyone. A, will you ask the states to renegotiate the funding agreement? I got that question before. Well, I mean, so I recently you stood alongside the Tasmanian Premier as one in supporting the voice. Yeah. What sort of feedback did you get from state and territory leaders today about what they're hearing on the ground, but did they feed into your uh, arguments for the yes vote? Uh, very positive. And one of the things about the state and territory leaders who are here is they're all unanimous in their support, as was, I must say, uh, Chris Minns's. Uh, predecessor Dominic Perrottet as well. Uh, this is an important reform. This is about giving respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but it's also about how Australians see ourselves, but also how the world sees Australia as well. So the principle, which is very clear, that we should, the, the what is recognition, uh, the how, as determined by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people themselves through an extensive consultation process leading up to the Uluru Statement from the Heart in 2017 is they want to be listened to. They want to be listened to so you get better practical outcomes. We close the gap. Everyone here is conscious of the fact that life expectancy is almost a decade shorter for Indigenous Australians compared with non-Indigenous Australians. That the gap in areas like infant mortality, issues of incarceration rates that are amongst the highest of any group in the entire world, that we can do better. And that when we listen, as state and territory governments have over issues like community health programs, justice reinvestment programs, uh, the Indigenous Rangers programs, you get better outcomes. And that's why 
uh, Australians in the lead up to the referendum will ask themselves as well, if not now, when? When do we recognise the great privilege that we have of sharing this continent with the oldest continuous culture on earth? And that's a commitment uh, that is shared and that's why you're seeing not just uh, state and territory leaders, but you're seeing leaders in the business community, you're seeing trade unions, you're seeing Pat Farmer run uh, 80 kilometres every day for six months. He's still in Tassie, I think, at this point in time. Uh, you're seeing sporting organisations all come together to say, now is the time uh, to get this done. We've been doing it the way of Canberra or state capitals deciding things for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. What they have asked for, and this proposal doesn't come from me, it doesn't come from any of the governments represented by the leaders here. It comes from them. It is a gracious request. It's a modest request, and it's one that should be taken. Is that proposed being an Australians are already facing I'm very confident that uh, we can get this right. Uh, I want to pay tribute to the workers at Liddell who've done such uh, extraordinary work over, over many, many decades. Uh, what we're seeing with the programs uh, that we've put in place, uh, such as Rewiring the Nation, uh, which has been uh, rolled out uh, across the states and territories, making sure that our energy grid is built for the 21st century uh, with the increased investment that you're already seeing uh, made by the private sector is that uh, we are uh, making a difference of lowering our emissions but also uh, increasing supply. The problem with the former government is that they had a decade of inaction and delay and denial. Uh, during that decade you saw four gigawatts leave the system and only one gigawatt come in and that uh, meant uh, that uh, we were more vulnerable a as a result. Now we want to provide that investment certainty which is why our targets of net zero and 43% by 2030 but also the safeguard mechanism was backed uh, not just by uh, environmental organisations, backed by the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group, uh, all called out for that to be supported in a bipartisan way. Premier, uh, one more. Premier, can we ask Premier Palaszczuk a question, please? Sure. Premier, last August you said there were lots of interesting ideas coming forward for Well Camp that would be shared with Queenslanders. What happened to those ideas and why were they never shared with Queenslanders? Uh, well Camp was built because our um, hotels were at capacity. We were in a different scenario to what we are today. And the Wagners have indicated that they look, they're looking at using that facility uh, for, uh, for agricultural uh, workers. Um, I saw comments today about Jared Blay um, up there, more interested in props than policies. And it's about time the opposition put together some policies. My about the ideas though. Well, no, well, I've answered your question. Well, that's not the government idea. That's, that's, on the, that's the way we, we were in a different situation to COVID. I made that very clear. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I made that very yep. clear. Yep. Migration review announced yesterday. Sure. Um, your, the, your, there's a record number of people expected to come into Australia. It's just outlined the situation that's looking pretty grim for housing, infrastructure, and you're working on health. Is Australia in a state in a condition to take all these migrants in right now? Well, to be, to be very clear about what's happened with migration uh, in this country is that uh, during the period of the pandemic, there was, of course, closed borders. So, that, for example, there are 60,000 students from China who are enrolled in courses in Australia. All of those were online. Guess what? They're coming back. They're, they're here now and, and increased student numbers from India as well. You also saw, of course, Australians not leaving in the numbers, and that's continuing to be the case, not leaving to work overseas to do the the six-month uh, visitation that occurred. Uh, you know, I did as a backpacker as a, a, a young fellow, 
uh, so did most of my, my generation, I've got to say. That hasn't uh, hit back as well. So if you look at the numbers for this year, uh, they're high, but that's in recognition of uh, the fact that the borders were closed previously. So they're still lower in terms of the population is lower today substantially than uh, it would have been in terms of the projections that were there prior to the pandemic. So that is occurring. What uh, Claire O'Neill, the minister, outlined uh, yesterday was a new migration strategy with an emphasis on with the global labour market, how do we attract the people who we need, the skills that we need, and where we need them as well. And that's why we'll work with state and territory governments uh, on those issues of how we deliver uh, better outcomes. It's a constructive proposal, and as uh, Minister O'Neill said yesterday at the National Press Club, uh, that if these measures are all put in place, she anticipates the actual migration number of permanent migration uh, will be lower than it would be otherwise under just a business as usual scenario. But we also need to recognise uh, the problems that are created by having uh, people here on a permanent basis but temporary, that contradiction. And there's nowhere that's more obvious than with our New Zealand uh, population who don't previously to the weekend didn't enjoy the same rights that Australians have when they go to New Zealand. So what we've done essentially is to regularise that so that for the 360,000 New Zealanders uh, who have been here for more than four years, paying taxes, contributing to their local communities, being engaged as well, uh, you had a real barrier and impediment uh, to uh, them being able uh, to be fully participating by becoming Australian citizens. We in this country have built this country with the exception of First Nations people, on people coming here for themselves and their children and their grandchildren seeking a better life, having that security of uh, permanency which is here. And we want that to happen uh, because that's the way that you build a better future and that is part of what will continue to work with state and territory. So Thanks very much.